As the sun descends over the Arabian Gulf, a US Navy jet returns from a seven-hour combat mission over Syria. For the USS Theodore Roosevelt, this has been the daily routine since last December, when she arrived here at the head of her carrier strike group, the sharp end of America's air war on Islamic State. The Roosevelt, known as CBN-71, was here at the very start of operations against IS or Daesh back in 2015. Back then, the CIA estimated the terror group had 31,000 fighters. Three years on, it's thought fewer than 1,000 are still alive, hemmed into a small area of the Euphrates River Valley in eastern Syria. So it's a pretty complex battle space right now. So uh, if you look at uh, where ISIS has uh, been corralled, it's very uh, small now. Uh, so that being said, uh, there's a lot of different um, militaries that are involved. And so in an effort to handle all the rules of engagement to make sure that uh, we're targeting the correct things uh, and doing it in, uh, in light of the rules of engagement that we're given, it's very, very complex for the pilots. From an air-to-air -air perspective uh, and an air-to-ground perspective, very tight quarters uh, with multiple militaries and multiple tactical airplanes uh, all over. The Roosevelt left San Diego in October, joining two other U.S. supercarriers, the Nimitz and Ronald Reagan, in the Western Pacific in a show of force to North Korea. From there, she continued her 12,000-mile journey, eventually arriving in the Arabian Gulf in December. The typical uh, amount of sorties for us a day is about 80 across the whole carrier, but actually going over the beach in support of uh, Operation Inherent Resolve, on average, is between 14 and 20. So it's definitely, we support about the same amount of sorties, but as you alluded to from about two years ago when we were out here, this air wing was out here doing strikes. We, do a lot, we did a lot more strikes back two years ago, where now we don't do nearly as many because uh, there's less ISIS to actually target. The USS Theodore Roosevelt cost $4.5 billion, around three billion pounds, and was commissioned in 1986, one of 10 Nimitz-class supercarriers operated by the US Navy. On board, she carries 70 aircraft and more than 5,000 sailors and airmen. Her flight deck is more than 300 metres long, the length of 39 London buses. During the Gulf War, the Roosevelt conducted more missions than any other carrier, and following the September 11th attacks, it was this ship that launched the first airstrikes on Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. The Roosevelt carries 44 F-18 Hornets and Super Hornets, electronic warfare aircraft, transport planes and 11 Seahawk helicopters. Below in her hangar bays, every inch of space is used. Hundreds of engineers and technicians working around the clock to keep her nine squadrons operational. They call the Roosevelt America's big stick and it's not difficult to see why. During her last deployment to the Gulf in 2015, her jets flew nearly 2,000 combat sorties against Islamic State. Three years on, the mission has changed and so has the battlefield. Islamic State are now confined to a much smaller area of Syria and for the pilots flying those missions, finding them is much more difficult. In late January, aircraft from the Roosevelt launched airstrikes on an Islamic State headquarters building in Syria, killing 150 terrorists in one go. And last month, for the first time, she launched simultaneous strikes over both Syria and Afghanistan in the same day. All told, the gear is about 30 pounds. On board CVN-71 are 298 pilots. Among them is Mark, a naval aviator since 2006. He's flown missions over Afghanistan and was a former member of the Blue Angels display right. team, Thanks, the US Navy equivalent of the Red Arrows. Like I said, we're there to support the US forces on the ground um, and to rid the area of ISIS occupation. Um, so a lot of what we're doing now is intelli intelligence gathering, uh, locating ISIS, developing those targets, and then once we have uh, essentially the prerequisites met for that target development, then we'll execute some sort of strike. Flying onto a carrier is a particularly dangerous business. The ship itself is moving at more than 30 miles per hour to generate the wind necessary for the aircraft to fly. As they approach at 150 miles an hour, the jets have to hook one of three arrestor wires in an area no bigger than four tennis courts. Guiding them onto the deck are the landing signal officers, making sure they're on the correct glide path to make a safe recovery. 
six storeys above the deck, is primary flight control. It's manned by former Navy pilots, and in here they monitor every air movement within five miles of the carrier. Personnel up here in the tower, we uh, watch the pattern, make sure the aircraft aren't going to hit each other and things like that. And uh, we also watch the flight deck to make sure nobody gets in front of a landing aircraft or in front of an aircraft that's taken off and uh, things like that. So they all know what they're doing. Sometimes they get, you know, maybe just kind of go off on a loop and run across the flight deck. Uh, so we'll wave off aircraft and stop aircraft from taking off if we have to uh, to save a life. Turning port here to starboard. A few stories below is the launch operations room, where they choreograph this complex ballet of moving parts. And the board you're looking at right here, this is the Ouija board, OK? This is a direct representation of what you're going to see out on the flight deck. All the little, all the little templates that you see right here are, are actually where the aircraft are at right now, OK? So right now, we're going to be launching the yellow, the yellow pins followed by the green pins. So what I do is I manage all the aircraft on board the flight deck and the hangar bay down below. Before long, the sun drops below the horizon and the Roosevelt descends into darkness. But this is a 24-7 war, and operations from her deck continue through the night, jets blasting off into the blackness and later returning from their missions. Our 18,000 feet shall be at three miles. And then you see we have them all lined up now. They're starting to come in, and it'll come pretty quickly. We land them about once a minute. Three decades after she was launched, CVN-71 can still deliver massive military power, a big stick that's still hitting hard. The pilots flying those bombing sorties don't travel lightly, as Jeremy from Strike Fighter Squadron 2-2 showed us. So this is a uh, special helmet that uh, when the visor comes down, it'll show uh, symbology in the helmet. So it uh, helps us uh, do a better job in the airplane. And then uh, the rest of the gear, we have a G-suit, uh, a harness for strapping into the seat, IROC welcome, and then uh, a survival vest that has uh, a lot of stuff on it. Camelback for drinking water, um, mask uh, for talking and breathing, uh, flashlights, all kinds of stuff. Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff here. How heavy is it? Quite heavy. So, uh, I don't know, probably 20 kilos, all told. It's uh, pretty heavy. So. Yeah, it keeps us safe, though, and helps us do our job. The USS Theodore Roosevelt is effectively a floating town, home to more than 5,000 sailors and airmen who deploy on average for seven months at a time. One of the largest warships in the world, she operates on an impressive scale. Navy pilots describe it as the best roller coaster ride in the world. Just before takeoff, they trim their F-18 jets ready for flight, take their hands off the controls, and wait to be shot down the deck at 170 miles an hour by the carrier's steam catapult. CVN-71 is effectively a small floating town. On average, she's away from home for seven months at a time. Roosevelt was the fourth of 10 supercarriers to be built for the US Navy. Her crew includes just under 3,000 sailors and more than 2,000 airmen and other trades. The carrier's desalination plant can produce one and a half million litres of fresh water from the sea every day. And inside, she's fitted with two and a half thousand kilometres of cable and wiring, 1,400 telephones, 14,000 pillowcases and 28,000 sheets. The carrier's crew can phone home and send emails, but some things remain off limits. Fraternisation is still frowned upon and alcohol is strictly banned. For all militaries, the internet is both a bonus and a bugbear. To try and stop operational security or OPSEC details being spilled on social media, the Roosevelt employs a rather clever tactic. So we have ombudsmen, and those are spouses of sailors on board. There's five wives right now that are back home in San Diego. Um, and one of them, their main job is to monitor what comes out on Facebook to see if anyone is, is putting out OPSEC for us. 
and as soon as she sees something, she emails me and we take care of it right away. Theodore Teddy Roosevelt was the 26th President of the United States, serving from 1901 to 1909. Throughout the ship, there's reminders of him and his passion for naval power. Uh, what's, what's the planned heading and the surface picture look like? Commanding the carrier is Captain Carlos Sardiello. A Navy pilot, he flew on the opening night of the Iraq War in 2003. Below in his cabin area, there's a collection of Roosevelt memorabilia. The room itself, a replica of the president's own office and furnished with the help of his family. A couple of items that are of interest on the wall here was Theodore Roosevelt's first address at the U.S. Naval War College where he talked about the importance of having a strong Navy and the benefits uh, to the nation and to stability around the world. Uh, here's a commissioning certificate while he was president of one of the officers who was on board the ex example fleet that he created, the Great White Fleet that w went around the world and personally signed by Theodore Roosevelt and donated to us to remind of his, of his uh, commitment and actions that transformed our Navy into a global maritime force. All of you, four of you, we'll go back over there. Fitness is a large part of life on board ship, some of it for pleasure, some of it less so. For these US Marines, today is all about pushing themselves to the limit, trying to stay fighting fit far away from home. Uh, white mocha. One thing the US military is very good at is taking America with it wherever it goes, from stateside coffee to familiar food and, of course, the razzmatazz of homegrown sports. And what could be more American than the Super Bowl? It's now four o'clock in the morning and on this mess deck, dozens of sailors have gathered to watch the big game, to cheer on their teams and forget for a few hours that they're thousands of miles from home. Feels good, you know, we ended up not watching any Jets today, so we got to sit down and watch the football, you know. Just, it's a good time to reset and just enjoy and just forget that we're on the boat for a good three hours or so. So, you know, it's just really, we really appreciate you. Also catching the game is 21-year-old Anthony Dutton, a native of Columbus, Ohio. He's firmly backing the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm huge into football. Like I said, I'm more of a, a Steelers fan, but any team against the Patriots, I will root for. Um, I feel like it's a way to relieve stress when you're watching a football game. Um, it's always fun. It's always fun, especially getting hit. I mean, I used to play myself, um, and it, that, that was one of the things that I liked about it is getting hit and actually being able to sit there and say, yeah, I played. The Roosevelt has five kitchens, preparing more than 18,000 meals a day. This galley alone serves up 4,300 eggs every single morning, and there's enough supplies on board to stay at sea for three months. We receive what's called replenish at sea once a week, approximately every Thursday, and we receive about anywhere between 300 pallets of fresh food, um, frozen food, so we can support it. So we spend about 65,000 a day on our food costs alone. During a lull in flying, the crew gather outside for what's called a FOD walk, sweeping the deck in search of any foreign objects, even something as small as a coin that could get sucked into a jet engine and cause a potential accident. On average, the Roosevelt sailors work 13 and a half hours a day with one rest day a week. When you joined the Navy, is this what you wanted to do? How did you end up in this role? Uh, honestly, didn't know what ABH was when I joined until I showed up here. Um, it wasn't what I expected. I was nervous at first and didn't want to do it, but once I got into the job, I enjoyed a lot. So I like being outside on the flight deck. I'd rather spend seven months outside than inside. So it's, I like it a lot. Living quarters on the carrier are based on seniority, and some are more cosy than others. In here, in one of the alleyways, we have uh, six racks to an alley. And the middle rack and the bottom racks have coffin style, which means they lift up, as you can see here. And we keep all of our stuff here, all the essentials, toiletries, clothing. And as you can see, this alleyway is uh, pretty cramped, as you, I can barely walk through it. And having six people in here, it can be pretty tight and pretty compact and you really have to like your neighbors and able to put up with them for about seven months. As well as these American aviators, a Royal Navy exchange pilot is also on board the Roosevelt, flying the F-18. For the past few years, British sailors and airmen have been training on these Nimitz-class warships, learning the skills they'll need to operate from the UK's new Queen Elizabeth-class carriers. My 
job previous to this, I was uh, part of the training for Queen Elizabeth uh, and setting her strike group and her strike group commander up for, uh, for getting ready to do that. Uh, it's a phenomenal ship, Queen Elizabeth is, and uh, bring her air arm here and uh, the escort ship that she plans, and I think it's going to be a phenomenal asset to help us out. For now, though, the U.S. Navy ships remain unrivaled. The next generation of American supercarriers, the Ford class, are due to come into service from 2020. On board will be F-35 Lightnings, and in years to come, squadrons of unmanned combat aircraft. With her nuclear reactors refueled, Roosevelt herself has another 20 years of life left. These Nimitz-class carriers still delivering U.S. military might across the globe. Well, that's it for this week. We'll see you next time. Probably the most dynamic environment that I've seen as far uh, as air-to-air -air assets go. To make this work and click as smoothly as it does, uh, it's a tremendous amount of work. A typical uh, amount of sorties for us a day is about 80 across the whole carrier. very, very complex for the pilots. From an air-to-air -air perspective uh, and an air-to-ground perspective, very tight quarters uh, with multiple militaries and multiple tactical airplanes uh, all over. battle, I would say, is not over. We're still conducting strikes and still conducting that close air support mission, um, and ISIS is still on the ground. They have not gone away and they're not giving up.